We hold these truths to be self-evident. That all men are created. As a member of Congress, I get to have a lot of really interesting people in the office. Experts on what they're talking about. This is the podcast for insights into the issues. China, bioterrorism, Medicare for all. In-depth discussions. Breaking it down into simple terms. We hold. We hold. We hold these truths. We hold these truths. With Dan Crenshaw. Hey guys, welcome back. We are back on the topic of Iran and how they've been dealing with COVID-19, whether they've been telling the truth or not, and whether or not they see this crisis as an opportunity to continue to flex their muscle in the Middle East. To help us with that conversation, uh, we have Benham Ben Talablu. He is a senior fellow at the Foundation for Defense of Democracies, which is a nonpartisan research institute focusing on foreign policy and national security. Uh, Benham, welcome. Thanks for being on. Great to be with you, sir. Always good to be on. Thank you. So, um, I mean, just give us an overview. Of what everybody's focused on, um, you know, their restaurants reopening and um, their their lives here during COVID nineteen. Uh, there's nobody's really reading that many stories about what's going on in the Middle East. So, what is going on in the Middle East, generally speaking? Uh, great point, because rightly so, we're focusing on our, our lives, physical, emotional, uh, welfare and health. Um, but history hasn't stopped and uh, America's adversaries haven't stopped. Um, as many of you may know, the Islamic Republic of Iran was very hardly hit uh, by the COVID-19, uh, otherwise known as the coronavirus. And uh, it came at a very unique time inside Iran, because really since 2017 to present, there's been an escalating series of protests. You could say it's the street versus the state. Um, and there have been more protests actually under Trump than on, under any other president, uh, protests that have really rocked the system. And these are protests in about 100 different cities across the country. They've gone from 2017 to present. Uh, they've been more blue collar folks, more nationalists in their chance. Uh, the disposition, you know, they may have a social trigger or an economic trigger, uh, but these are folks who are upset with the way their country is being run. And for lack of a better word, they want their country back. So the coronavirus crisis uh, was the a, a new layer to the regime botching things for the population. Um, we know that it has the highest reported death toll in the Middle East. Uh, recently, according to Johns Hopkins University, if I'm not mistaken, which is a, it aggregates official numbers Turkey has now overtaken Iran in terms of infections, but even members of Iran's own parliament don't buy the official numbers. They believe it's several fold higher. People, when the story was reported about COVID-19 in Iran back in February, they thought that it was at least three or four times higher. Uh, now there's unofficial, again, highly anecdotal reports that it could be 10 times higher. Uh, the problem is no one knows. On a good day, the government of the Islamic Republic of Iran is not transparent, let alone now when they see this health crisis as an economic crisis and, of course, as a national security crisis. I think they're beginning to understand how badly they botched this crisis, like they botched many other things in 2019. Well, um, well did, but, did they or did I mean, why did it hit Iran so much harder than any other country in the Middle East? I mean, there, there's a there's a reason for that, right? The Belt and Road Initiative through China. There's, yeah, that, that's, a, that's a very good point because uh, Iran really for the past decade or so has been willing to carry water more for America's great power competitors, for the Russians, particularly the Chinese. Both pre and post sanctions under Obama and Trump, China has been the largest legal and illegal importer of Iranian oil. And the Iranians definitely don't want to upset the Chinese. Uh, the Iranians even allegedly reportedly sent some kind of health equipment. I think masks it was. Uh, to the Chinese once the story was reported about Corona in China. Um, in the holy city of Qom, which is a, a city on the, the edge of an Iranian desert south of the capital, Tehran, uh, was where the Corona-19 virus, uh, the coronavirus was first reported. Not only does China have a lot of clerical religious students in the holy city of Qom, um, but as you just mentioned, there is, I believe, a Belt and Road Initiative by China being built I think it's like a high-speed railway station uh, in that city. I think this was reported in 2019 or 2018, if I'm not mistaken. Mm -hmm. We don't know the status of that project, but we know that there are also, and there have been direct flights to China between Iran uh, and China, and even direct flights between uh, Iran and Wuhan, which is the, the hub for where the virus was inside China. Tehran is desperately reliant on China, again, 
for economic purposes. But come October, um, there is a UN arms embargo that is expected to lapse unless the administration's efforts now um, pay off, which is to find a way to extend this, this uh, UN arms embargo. Mm-hmm. And the Iranians will be looking to the Chinese to modernize much of their military equipment. So the Iranians have every incentive to look the other way. And even though the virus came from the East, the Iranians are pointing a finger using conspiracy theory at the West. Yeah, well, so is our media. So <laughs> they're, 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 they're in good company. Um, the, uh, how, 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 so let's talk about the arms embargo then. What is, um, explain the background of that, uh, why it's expiring. And um, obviously we have an interest in continuing an arms embargo against a, a state like Iran that wants to wipe Israel off the map and uh, wipe, wipe us off the map if they could. Well, uh, I, unfortunately, I think I think you're right. There's a lot of the officials, the IRGC, that's the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps folks. For them, when they say death to America, death to Israel, they, you know, it animates them. These are people who cut their teeth on these issues during the Cold War, uh, during the Iran Iraq War. These are uh, ideological, battle hardened believers. That doesn't mean they're not capable of real politique or a little bit of flexibility. Uh, but their number one thing is their survival of the regime. And they believe their regime has to be in this constant state of conflict with these adversaries mm-hmm. that you mentioned, uh, Israel and America. The arms embargo, uh, and let's not forget, I think it was President Reagan who resurrected an arms embargo on Iran when Iran was officially designated uh, a state sponsor of terrorism. So no U.S. weapons technically uh, can go to Iran for a very long time, for a little over the three decades. But starting in 2006, when the UN Security Council, because of Iran's nuclear program, was putting the spotlight on all these malign actors in Iran and beginning to go after them with sanctions, um, there was an arms embargo at the UN level that was agreed to, I think, in a 2006 or 7 resolution and passed, actually. And that arms embargo didn't have an expiration date. And I think that represented the consensus and the understanding of the international community that the world's foremost state sponsor of terrorism, which at that point, and in my view still is, interested in a military nuclear program, should not have advanced destabilizing conventional weapons. Um, That was something even the Russians and Chinese were able to agree to as they watched Iran illicitly expand its nuclear program. And in 2015, uh, Iran's foreign minister, Mohammad Javad Zarif, won a major concession against the Obama negotiating team. Major concession. Uh, He got this arms embargo, which was not time limited, to be time limited and not put in the New Deal, this JCPOA, the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action, but to be put in the UN Security Council resolution that codifies and enshrines the deal. As you know better than I, because you're actually in in, in Congress, uh, the JCPOA is not a treaty here. Uh, So the most important legal architecture that deals with this deal is the UN Security Council resolution. So Zarif won a a, a, a expiration date for this arms embargo, totally not tied to Iran's bad behavior. And that expiration date is October 2020. And come October 2020, Iran would be able to buy any non-American advanced conventional weaponry. I've done analysis of things that they could buy. I don't think they're going to become a conventional power overnight, but they are going to engage in a campaign of selective military modernization, buying a couple of different missile systems, perhaps cruise missiles, most likely uh, from the Russians and Chinese, uh, as well as potential uh, aircraft, fixed wing aircraft and tanks. And that could permit them to be a more potent regional threat. and push our ad, our allies in the region around and, and through coercion and, and deterrence and even perhaps punishment. Uh, and that is something very dangerous, something the administration has rightly focused on because they're looking to use the UN mechanisms to actually extend this arms embargo. And the fact that it's taken so long is I think a shame because it tells us that our partners, our transatlantic partners who rightly stand with us in these halls like the UN have, are yet to put their money where their mouth is on this issue. Yeah, well, th- these international organizations are only as good as the people that make them up. And, um, you know, as, as, as countries like China continue to remind us, their, their interests are just different. Um, you know, they, they don't, sh- it doesn't seem they share that, that, that fundamental sense of global security and, and rule of law that we should all live by. Um, right. What else has been going on and why, why should we be worried about Iran pursuing uh, conventional weapons? You know, obviously we let plenty of other countries 
uh, arm themselves in, in the nature of self-defense, but Iran is, is a different actor, of course. So what else has been going on? They've, they've launched a satellite recently. They've been, um, they've been bugging us with their little, with their little fishing boats. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm being pejorative there to the, to the Iranian Navy, but, um, but they, the, the way the Iranian Navy works is they, it's, it's more of a uh, quantity over quality kind of, uh, strategy where the, I, I remember being, um, deployed in the Middle East and what we would, what we would, um, worry about, not worry, but, um, I guess assess as a course of action is just thousands of these little gunboats just coming at you and, um, like a, like a swarm, uh, as opposed to an actual battleship that is, uh, as capable as a U.S. ship. And so, um, but which th these things often harass U.S. ships, um, and sometimes they'll even board them like they did. Well, what year was that? 2015? No, uh, 16, no, 2016. Yeah. Hostage. Right, 2016, and uh, right, they took a, they boarded a U.S. Navy patrol boat. Um, we sh never should have let them do that, and uh, actually held them for at least a day or two. Uh, it was quite embarrassing for the United States, and uh, this prompted President Trump to, I think, do the right thing, which is say what we always should have said: if you mess with us, we'll shoot you. Don't mess with us. You know, there, there's a rules of the road on, on the ocean. Um, we all abide by it. There's a, there already is a law and order and a mutual respect. So just abide by it or we'll shoot you. And, uh, that's, that prompted that. So there's, there's obviously still ongoing tension in the Iranians. The Iranian regime is clearly not focused inward dealing with COVID-19. They're, they're also focused outward. This is, that was a re really good context because while there is a real human healthcare economic plight at home, uh, there is a continuation of this long-standing policy that this government, the Islamic Republic, has had for 41 years now, which is the export of the revolution. You know, uh, on February 11, 1979, that's the victory day, if you will, uh, for the Islamic Revolution in Tehran. Um, since really that time, they've been looking at projecting power outward. And, you know, when you look at Iran on paper, you know, the government of the Islamic Republic, there isn't much, you know, in terms of military spending, in terms of the qualitative military capabilities. But nonetheless, for 41 years, this country has really been a thorn in the side of U.S. interests, U.S. security, and our allies and our partners in the region uh, when it comes to their interests and their security. Um, and that's because they've been able to do so much with so little. You know, uh, you have served in the region, sir. You've been in uniform. Uh, it costs a hell of a lot more to equip a Green Beret and send him or her into battle. Uh, but it costs comparatively less for Iran to be able to cobble together proxies. Literally, it's taking Afghan refugees and sending them to die as cannon fodder on behalf of its ideological mission in Syria. Um, Iran has been able to cobble together this patchwork of foreign militias to exert its interests in the region, to slowly encircle Israel, to slowly overtake the state system in the region. And when the region is weak, this country, this regime is strong. And it's looking to signal strength, not just in terms of these military capabilities, but uh, in terms of status. And that gets the satellite program you mentioned, which I'll hit before we go to the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps Navy. Um, you know, Iran's interest in rocketry um, date back to, you know, when the Shah, the late king, was in power. But really, during the Iran-Iraq war, Iran became fascinated with missiles because Saddam Hussein uh, was fighting an eight-year war with Iran then. And he showered missiles both on military and civilian targets. Iran went to Syria, Libya, North Korea, really enshrining itself, if you will, uh, in the axis of evil with its ties with North Korea, to borrow a phrase. And Iran now, according to multiple directors of national intelligence, has the largest ballistic missile arsenal in the Middle East, the largest. And um, in addition to this ballistic missile arsenal, it's been interested in satellites. Most of these satellites, in fact, all these satellites have been based on a North Korean missile they got in the 90s called the Nodong A. The engine for these satellites is, is uh, liquid propellant. Uh, it, that Nodong A became the basis for Iran's first ever nuclear capable medium range ballistic missile. Uh, Iranian media outlets put this missile on graphics uh, that are called, where they display all of their medium range missiles. And that graphic is called Iran's Israel hitting missile. So they're telling you the mission they had in mind for this. Um, but this satellite test, unlike the most recent few, did not fail. It succeeded. 
And there's been a lot of reason to worry about this satellite test because uh, while the previous ones were entirely believed to be uh, liquid propellant engines, which may not be the best basis for a, a one-day ICBM, you could move towards it, but it would be a, not the best choice. Uh, there was a motor, a solid propellant motor, that had a moving nozzle that basically allowed the nozzle on the end of the engine to guide the missile rather than through finlets or any kind of other slits in the body of the missile. And this is, was, a, was a huge technical leap for the Islamic Republic. In fact, many didn't believe it when this engine was revealed in February. But this engine formed the second stage of a three-stage satellite launch vehicle that was launched uh, last week successfully. Normally, Iran's space agency, which is overseen by Iran's government, quote-unquote, the presidency, um, uh, builds these satellites. This was done entirely uh, by the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps Aerospace Force. Um, so it tells you, you know, who is in charge of this program. And uh, it really it really has uh, unnerved much of the technical community, rightly so, because this would be this is a game changer if they are able to sub out, you know, different stages of this system with to make it all solid propellant, which is what the commander of the IRGC Aerospace Force said he will do. Right. So Iran is signaling what it's going to do. It's going to make this satellite launch vehicle and that would basically give it a, a basis to one day move closer to an ICBM, not just yeah. targeting, being able to target all of America, but all of Europe. Right, and, and that, that, right that's the important that. part. We we don't care that they put satellites in space. Um, I think the Pentagon called this satellite a tumbling webcam in space, um, which is kind of funny. But uh, you know, they, 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 yeah, right? we we don't we don't care if they put up satellites. That's not the problem for us. The the the, the reason they're putting up satellites in the first place um, because it's debatable whether. I'm not, I'm not sure what they would use a satellite for. Um, you know, I, I could be wrong about that. Maybe they have some kind of interest in an actual satellite, but mostly their interest is in building the rocket that can get the satellite up. Because if you can put a satellite in in a rocket, you can put a a, a warhead in a rocket. That's that's the point. Exactly. And they've been experimenting with this. And while the past few tests of a different satellite launch vehicle have failed. As you know, we learned during the Cold War, testing satellite launch vehicles and also ICBMs, um, you learn from a failed test. Failed tests provide you with data, but this was something even better than a failed test for them. This was a successful test of a secret space launch program that is now public. And it is a part of Iran's history. You know, their nuclear program, there was a covert, parallel, overt uh, uh, cycle. They had, like now, with the space program, an overt cycle, and now there's a covert cycle, which is now public. And they are clearly signaling their intentions here. And it is very worrisome for the West, um, because Iran really will be able to overcome these things. Like, for instance, much of the West tends to believe Khamenei, that he says all his missiles are going to be capped at 2,000 kilometers. Mm -hmm. Yes, technically, their arsenal doesn't really go over 2,000 kilometers. But these new systems provide them with this game-changing capability to move to rapidly break through that, that barrier. Right. And we should not be t uh, take solace in their words. We should take solace in their capabilities being more limited and constrained. And that's why the Trump administration has to really focus on this issue and continue its max pressure policy. So what do the Iranian people think about all this? I mean, they're they're dealing with COVID-19 right now. H how many people have died or hospitalized in Iran? Is it is it still pretty overwhelmed? What's what's the situation there? There's there's official figures, I believe, today, which it was like 5,700. So those official figures keep rising. Again, I tend to believe that that 5,700 what? Uh, people dead total uh, from COVID-19. Okay. Uh, but I tend to believe that's really more of a price floor. That's what the government will admit. You know, healthcare workers in that country really deserve immense praise. They are first responders. You see videos of nurses and healthcare workers going into shanty towns trying to distribute masks and sanitizers early on when this crisis broke. There is a crisis of confidence in the government, and the government, I think, knows that. It took about a month and a half for Khamenei, the country's quote unquote supreme leader, to tap into this national wealth fund. Why wasn't that tapped into earlier? You know, they spent a month and a half blaming Western sanctions, which actually not only do not penalize humanitarian trade, actually have created this specific channel with the Swiss government to actually be able to process these transactions faster and at a greater rate. Have, um, they, have they gotten a lot of Western aid? 
actually the Swiss is the Swiss government is is a good place to focus on here because um, Iran tends to get more medical equipment from Western and and Central Europe rather than it does from East Asia, and even with sanctions at their peak, what FED analysis has proven is that uh, while trade with Iran has fallen once Trump restored sanctions, there has only been a small downturn in the medical trade between Switzerland or the EU and Iran. And that's amazing. And that shows that sanctions are not impacting this very important trade, which I think should be continuing. And what the administration needs to do and should be doing is point to this data. Uh, I I believe it was Patrick Moynihan, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, I don't want to misattribute the quote, but he said, "You, you can have your own opinions, you can't have your own facts. And for a very long time now, there are people who want to claw their way back to that fatally flawed nuclear deal and to removing sanctions on Iran and letting Iran have a free hand in the region to repress its people at home and and engage in aggression abroad um, and are now citing this humanitarian suffering caused by the regime as a way to get rid of the Trump administration sanctions. And I think that's totally unfair. Yeah. And so I guess I I go back to the the question of how do the Iranian people feel? you know, what, what do we? How much information do we have on what a typical Iranian thinks about the regime, their response to, to COVID nineteen? What, what does a typical Iranian think about China now that it's it's pretty obvious? I mean, we can. I'm, I'm sure the I'm sure the government of Iran didn't do a great job uh, dealing with the crisis either. But it is a pandemic after all. So there's again, I, I, a bit of grace might be in order. Um, the, the, again, this came from China, and it came from the Iranian regime's uh, reliance on China and uh, the massive amount of travel that happens between the two countries. That's why Iran and Italy were hit the worst uh, first and foremost, because they're both part of that Belt and Road Initiative. So does does your typical Iranian like that? Um, do they? Would, does your typical Iranian wish for more relations with the West? Uh, where, where are, you know, post Soleimani strike where where are we at in the minds of the street you know how does the street talk about the united states now well i'll, I'll do my best to be humble based on um because you know you don't want to represent the entire nation just by being one person one iranian american but 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 here's what we know most iranians identify themselves more with the west than with the east when they see iran being successful they think of a more integrated iran with western economies rather than with eastern economies they are familiar unfortunately they're all too familiar with uh bombast that came from people like iran's former holocaust denier in chief ahmadinejad who talked about you know an eastern orientation relying on russia and china to offset western sanctions and iranians have seen chinese products flood their markets for well over a decade and a half two decades now and it's pretty clear they don't like what they see uh, they prefer even more bootleg versions of some Western products rather than just Chinese products straight up. That's why when I mentioned the medical trade, it's really clear that Iranians prefer medicines produced elsewhere, not you know medicines uh, that were generic or produced uh, somewhere in East Asia. It's it's a measure of, of, of success, of status for the Iranian people to be identified um, with the West um because it's seen as integration into the global economy and rightly so they are pointing a finger at their own government and not at western sanctions uh even under peak coronavirus crisis conditions they seem to understand this you know when i talked about those different waves of protests in 2017 18 19 20 there was a really important protest by members of tehran's bazaar that's like their merchant class they were outside their parliament building and they were protesting saying our enemy is here. They lie when they say it's in America. The Iranian people understand who is responsible chiefly for their misery. Their government continues to make a whole series of choices that is akin to basically saying, no, we're not going to put Iran first. And the Iranian people are fed up with it. They've, you mentioned the Soleimani strike. The regime has had a bunch of botched crises in, in, in 2020. Uh, it, you know, it tried to make the, the Soleimani's funeral, the rally that happened briefly after it last. It did not last at all. There was the Ukraine airliner incident where they, they killed over, I think it was 170 some odd people, all innocent. They shot that plane out that of the sky. So tragic. I, I, you know, as soon as that happened, I, I didn't say anything publicly because I didn't have the facts, but... I was. I knew exactly what they'd done. I mean, it, I, I was like, this was not on purpose. I don't think, but it's very obvious that you know you've got a you've got an untrained radar specialist there who just thought that a that a cruise missile was coming in and they shot down the plane. 
Um, exactly. It was just so, I knew exactly what happened as soon as that, I was like, a, it was just really and tragic. I, I saw something on like the Iranian social media universe. And I have to admit, I'm not the most proficient person in, in uh, social media, uh, mocking some of these new IRGC and uh, Artesh, that's the national military uh, developments, which are they claim to have developed sensors that can detect corona and a bunch of other viruses from so far away. But these things look really outdated. It's, it's highly questionable. At, that's me being very polite about this technology. And someone had actually tweeted saying, I can't believe these guys are claiming to have developed something that can detect corona from X meters away, but their radar couldn't detect if it's a plane, a civilian plane or a cruise missile. Yeah. Um, this, well, this is yeah. really the status of what's going on. Yeah, so, there's this always desire from the Iranian regime to appear, um, I, I guess, more competent than it really is. Um, that, that seems to be part of, of, the, of the game, kind of like the Chinese government. These authoritarian... Of, yeah, go ahead. Sorry, yeah. there's there's a lot of bombast, but sometimes within that bombast, there is these quantum leaps in their capabilities. Like this, again, this February, that solid propellant engine really is a game changer for the Islamic Republic. But amidst that, there is a lot of bombast about their space capabilities. So then what and is, the same, of course, goes here with everything you were saying about these other pure competitors of America who talk a lot because they expect this tough talk to deter us and confuse us. It does confuse us. Uh, it works quite quite well, mostly because we're so divided um, in, in this country, and in, and you know, especially now with with a guy like President Trump, I think I think President Trump's critics will will take whatever position they need to simply to undermine his decision. Um, I, I think that's fundamentally true. Now, did Republicans do it to Obama during the JCPOA uh, negotiations? Yeah, we didn't. They didn't give an inch. I wasn't there, so I'll, I'll say they. Um, that being said, it, it was it was not based on Obama himself. It was based on the fact that we we didn't believe that was good policy. It seems to me that every time that 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 the <clears throat> the criticism of Trump seems to be just because it's him. And uh, I find that to be a problem as as we go forward with with our maximum pressure campaign and, and really just designing policy moving forward. So let's talk about designing policy moving forward. We're we we we've still got a sort of half JCPOA in place uh, because the Europeans haven't pulled out of it, but we have. The Iranians um, have also sort of said they're pulling out of it. Um, it it's, it's all confusing. So, I mean, it's, uh, I, I think confusing still is the right word as to, as to what's going on there. Um, Iran continues to, to meddle, but not in a huge way. It's, it's, it, it, it continues to be just around the edges, around the region. I think they were, were, they were, they definitely had to recalculate how they would escalate against us after, after the Soleimani strike. Um, you know, there's, there's still some, some, um, rocket attacks every once in a while in Iraq against our bases by Shia militias. Uh, but, you know, for anybody who's been following the Middle East for a long time, that that has never stopped. That's always been going on. It's kind of a way of life when you're on a base in the Middle East. Uh, so, you know, they, they continue these things. They're not, they've, they've clearly stopped escalating it massively. They'll, they're, as we've noticed, their their little yacht club, their U.S., their, their Iranian Navy is, harasses our ships, but, but, but when I say harass, it means they get close to them. Okay, so people have to understand when we're in the Navy, when we're saying, oh, you know, there's there's some kind of harassment going on, it usually means they're just getting too close for comfort, and um, and it's uh, it's it's meant just to be a an annoyance, right? It's meant to be some kind of show of force, demonstrate that you're in our territory, so we can do what we want, and and, and we and we basically say the same thing back. So how do we how do we continue the maximum pressure campaign? How how do we ensure Iran doesn't achieve a nuclear weapon. What what uh what do you say to the critics? Um, you know the uh, what's his name, um, Obama's national security advisor who just won't go away, uh, Ben Rhodes. What do you say to him? Because you know who, who's just in love with himself and 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 then the JCPOA that that he designed and got the media to uh, create an echo chamber on. You know because they because they would say, hey, we 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 successfully stopped the Iranians from from building a bomb. Now we have no way to stop them. How could you do this? You know, the, the, there's so much there you said, sir, but uh, let me briefly start with the, the Ben Rhodes bit. Uh, the easiest way to debunk him is if they had really stopped the Iranian nuclear program, if they had really 
successfully done this, there would have been no infrastructure for the Iranians to return to so easily, to have so many nuclear violations so quickly, and to be able to already have more than one bomb's worth of low enriched uranium on their own territory. Yeah, that's check. That's checkmate to Ben Rhodes. Right. <laughs> that's and that's and that's what that was always thing. that was always the counter argument because we always said like yeah you can you can rely on their goodwill. We can't get into their military bases. We 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 still don't have a baseline. We we never knew how far they'd gotten. Um, the Obama administration and Ben Rhodes was just willing to throw their hands up and say no, it's fine. We should just trust them. And uh, it was it was always obvious that as soon as this thing expired, because the Iranians are patient, we are not patient. This is the problem with our, you know, this. Well, it's not a problem with elections; it's a feature of elections that we're short sighted and we, we think in four year terms and foreign policy wins that people can run elections on, and um, that's that that can be harmful. Uh, whereas the Iranians, ten to fifteen years for them, that's a blink of an eye. I mean, they're, 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 to them, they're the civilization that's been around for thousands of years. Why would, they, why would they blink an eye at 10 to 15 years? Basically, at the end of 10 to 15 years, they can, they can go right to that bomb, right? And um, they're still not technically allowed to, but the deal is done. I, I, I agree with you in, in principle about the way that the government of the Islamic Republic thinks. I would just one small respectful pushback, one little caveat which is as an Iranian American, I, I don't want to give the millennia of civilization, history, culture, language, accomplishments, contributions to human civilization to this regime, which has only been around 41 years and mm -hmm. this thuggish, brutish, authoritarian has very little to do with Iranian culture and has combined some of the wor world's worst elements of Islamist and Marxist government and put it all into one. It, it really has the a conglomerate feature of the Cold War's uh, third world authoritarian dictatorships with a bunch of oil in it. Yeah, uh, it, fair enough. It is, not, it is not the inheritor of that great civilization. Nonetheless, they are great. Some of, some of them are good strategic thinkers. A, a whole bunch of them tend to know how to shoot themselves in the foot real fast. Uh, but I think they're even better tacticians than strategists. Um, I feel like there's a couple of analysts who may also agree with this as well. Um, and the good thing about max pressure is that it, it, it moves them not just from strategist to tactician, but to reactionary. Um, the Iranians will not have the luxury if the, the max pressure campaign continues, which, you know, if I hypothetically run into President Trump in the street after the lockdown or whatever, uh, and he says, Benham, what do you think about Iran policy? What should we do? And if I could only say one sentence, I would say, sir, don't swerve, double down. Yeah. Well, they, they, they only respond to power. I mean, they only respond to power. Again, there's, and I want to be respectful of, somewhat respectful of, of what the last administration tried to do. But the, the best way to describe it is to buy them off, to buy them off with goodwill and, and, and hope that they change. I mean, and this is a very literal thing they did. There was a pallets of cash sent to the Iranian regime, um, sanctions lifted. This is effectively buying somebody off to, to engage in, in good behavior. And um, the, the problem with that is that is the same problem we have with North Korea. They keep they keep moving the goalposts. They will always one up us. They will always say, well, and they'll pocket the concession, too. They'll right. The <laughs> they'll pocket the concession. And, and we saw, you know, I remember again, I, re I remember um, seeing the reports that IRGC funding would be going up right after the JCPOA was signed, because where are they putting that money? Well, not in their pandemic response. It's it's going into the IRGC, and yeah. it's going up again now. The, you know, the Iranian New Year is in March. That's when new budgets come out. Mm -hmm. Under coronavirus crisis conditions, the priority is to continue to beef up the security states. This is this is really this tells you where their priorities are. It's not right. about Iran first. It's about Islamic Republic first. Is this um, um some some people would argue this and it's it's a it's an honest debate about how rational. The regime of Iran is, you know, same same with North Korea, right? There's always this question of how rational are they? Um, because it seems to me, with my Western mind, that if you were rational, you you would actually make a lot of concessions, open up your economy, and 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 give your people a better life, right? It would it would be just that easy. It wouldn't nobody's going to invade your space. I, it, there's no reason to think that. There's no reason for you to want nuclear energy. Uh, that's that's always that's always been a a, a stretch of the imagination to try, try and figure out why Iran, for some reason, just loves nuclear energy and, and that and, and its carbon 
carbon free emissions so much that it just has to build them uh, that nobody's ever believed that uh, not 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 from an oil state. So, you know, that doesn't seem rational to me. Um, do they do they actually just not trust us? Do they actually believe that we will infiltrate infiltrate their government and overthrow them? Or do they or is it is it purely ideologically driven? Do they just hate anything um, that is westernized and that isn't um, you know their, their line of thinking? Well, you know, I, I'm I'm I come down in an interesting position on this because I self identify as a Ron Hawk. Again, I'm a, I think max pressure for historical reasons uh, that are that are based on how this regime because it's only very only a handful of times in its 41 year existence has it done an about face on a national security issue. Mm -hmm. um, for those reasons, I believe, you know, Iran only responds to the very tough pressure. Uh, otherwise, it has no incentive to change uh, its very ideological way of doing things. Because if it has no encumbrances, why should it change its way of doing things? If it believes a certain set of things, values, interests, systems, it's not going to change it unless it's really confronted. So it's really about not just capabilities, but the resolve or the will to keep that pressure on over time. So that's that's the that's the big level. On the on the rationality bit, I, I take a different tack. I think they are too rational. You know, drawing not to make this academic, but like drawing from, you know, Max Weber's political scientist, you know, typologies of rationality, they are means ends rational. They look at their means and they know their ends and they know how to get there. Now those may be ideological ends, but they are using their limited means quite well, I think, unfortunately for us, to be able to get there. That taps into the patient's argument. That taps into why they're an asymmetric military power, not a conventional military power. That taps into why they do a lot of this harassment and proxy warfare rather than, you know, direct head-on confrontation and battleships and, you know, formal battalions. Um, this, this they are they learn they when when confronted with an exogenous shock when confronted with something they don't know there is an adaptability uh to this adversary which makes them more lethal than they appear on paper now they are gambling very much that we are irresolute over time and for them there is a very sticky impression that you know america left beirut after 83 because the marine barracks uh, America didn't respond after the Hobar Tower attacks, killing, I believe, 19 U.S. service people in, in, in Saudi Arabia. Ultimately, the narrative in the minds of the IRGC and Soleimani's friends in Iran is that uh, these militias and proxies and the Quds Force is what evicted America from Iraq in 2011. And again, an, a sufficient cycle of escalation will be all it takes to make Trump leave Iraq as well, uh, that, that they wanted to keep Assad and Assad remained in Syria. Uh, there is there are a series of events that are very sticky in the minds of the revolutionary elite in Iran, yeah. and that and they believe that they can double down. Um, I have again no evidence for this, but I can totally see Khamenei, Iran's supreme leader, you know, sitting in some national security session and saying this injunction, which is uh, is directly from the Quran, which is Inna la ma sabri, verily God is with the patient. And that's what they're trying to do here. They're trying to outlast us. And with yeah. the current administration, they're trying to outlast the max pressure policy. Right. They're hoping that there's a change. Well, they're and right. That Iran <laughs> becomes a political issue and that, you know, there's a return to the JCPOA and that hopefully they can charge the international community for the time taken off by the deal. They're hoping that everyone says the Middle East doesn't matter and that Iran can run amok in the region. And there, this is a calculated bet by this regime. But the reason I think the Trump administration's pressure policy is correct is it's turning time on its head. Because if the Iranians are going to use time as a weapon, we have to make the time as costly as possible for them. Right. Yeah, but unfortunately, you're right. Well, they are very rational. I guess. I guess my question was: is the is the ends that they seek out are those rational? And I guess in their minds they're rational. In my mind, in my mind, it's not rational. But you know, that's that's why we're different. Um, and uh, and unfortunately, you're they are totally correct that we have uh, inconsistent policies. I mean, if if Joe Biden won the presidency, there's no doubt that they'd go back to to paying off. He might hire Ben Rhodes again, and there's no <laughs> doubt that 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 did go back right back to paying off the Iranian regime. And, you know, th this really, this Although I will say this. Go ahead. Sorry, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. Well, I was going to say this problem really was made clear to me when, um, during my master's program, we actually had to do a simulation where I pretended to be the U.S. president, like 
10 to 15 years. I can't remember the exact date that we decided. I think it was around 10 years after the JCP. So 2025, um, after the JCPOA was signed and the United States government was asking the Iranian government to come back to the table and, and negotiate an extension to the deal. Um, and, and under this simulation, the Iranians had complied with it perfectly, uh, you know, as, as we probably would expect them to. Um, but they were wondering, and this is my classmates pretending to be Iranians, were wondering why on earth they'd even bother coming back to the table. And I'm left wondering, as the United States, like, what leverage would we have at this point? You know, what are we, or are we just going to slap back sanctions? Because the Iranians would play the victim there. And they would say, how could you slap back sanctions? We complied. You can't do that. You know, what, what's your, what's your, what's your um, reasoning here? And they're very good at playing the victims. And, and you know, institutions like the UN seem to... Um, seem to cater to that kind of ideology as well. And so you find yourself with almost no leverage. And so in that simulation, the only leverage I, I was able to, to scrounge up was we're going to threaten you. <laughs> I mean, there's, we're going to threaten you and that's the only way to do it. And you just, you, we live, it was so obvious at that moment that we were leaving ourselves in this really terrible situation where the Iranian regime was enriched to an extensive degree, stronger than ever before able to build a nuclear weapon if they wanted to just like that, because as you've noted, it takes very little time. Once you've built the capacity for nuclear energy, it's very easy to move quickly to a nuclear bomb. It just is. Um, if you, if you don't, if you don't get rid of the nuclear program itself, you're not getting rid of the nuclear weapons program. That's just a fact. It just takes, it takes very little time. And, um, you know, we have no leverage. We have no leverage at, after that deal sunsets. I, I, sincerely hope that whoever that the, the, the cast of characters is on uh, the Biden foreign policy team heard exactly what you just said, sir, because uh, that was the challenge. And I remember actually while the deal was in place, talking to Europeans, uh, talking to people who actually, again, they, they would identify the same threats as us, terrorism, missiles, human rights, cyber, freedom of navigation, all these issues. Um, but again, not going to be able to put their money where their mouth is. And there was often discussion of things like, well, we do need a better deal. There's the C in JCPOA stands for comprehensive, but that deal is anything but comprehensive. It only addresses and briefly and poorly the nuclear issue. Mm -hmm. It doesn't address what has made and sustained the Islamic Republic of, of Iran a threat for 41 years. Yeah, that's it, true. It, it simply, it simply doesn't do that. In fact, it, by trying to foolhardily only address that one issue, it's making those other threats worse. And that's why the missiles are getting better and more accurate and more dangerous, and the, and the proxy network is growing, and the naval harassment is growing. All these things are direct follow-ons from that bad deal. Yeah. And, and you know, and how, how can I'm we... a little cautiously optimistic, because, again, I, I, I know for some reason you know, I'm paid to study the intricacies of, of Iranian security policy, domestic policy, foreign policy. So... I don't know much. I, I tend to know more about Tehran than Washington, um, and so I don't, I don't comment on U.S. domestic politics. But um, I'm at least glad that Joe Biden's statement on the coronavirus uh, didn't call for a full-scale return to the deal. He actually was calling for the administration to do things that the administration actually has already done or is doing. You know, providing licenses, opening up channels for humanitarian trade, working with Europeans, uh, that kind of thing. Um, because so, watching some of the earlier debates on the, the Democratic side was very worrisome. Because if you did have something like, with respect, something like Senator Sanders was saying, or some of the other folks, uh, the, benef the beneficiary of that policy would not have been America or Senator Sanders or their administration. The beneficiary would have been the Ayatollah in Tehran, who once again would assess that for political reasons, America needs a deal more than Iran economically needs a deal. Right. And once your adversary realizes you need something more than they do, this is coming from a Middle Eastern kind of view with, again, yeah, respect. They're expert uh, negotiators. They will charge you, they will charge you your father's blood many for it. Yeah. They will really overcharge you. And, and the JCPOA really is a testament to the fact that the, the Iranians realized for political reasons how badly uh, they, the previous administration wanted, wanted the deal. And my cautionary note to the Trump administration, because I think we're going to be moving into another summer of Iranian escalation here, is to not signal through Twitter or other mediums that he would like to meet with Rouhani so often or, or anything like that. Because um, 
the strength of this policy should do the talking. Right. And, well, that's good and, advice. And because um, I was going to ask you, was I, you, know, you said double down on maximum pressure campaign, but I can't imagine you think it's all being done perfectly. So, you know, you just gave one critique there, which is, you know, there's there's a messaging um, issue that, that we have to take control of. But also the other question I was going to ask is how do we ensure that we don't lose um, lose? I'm not saying we have support from the Iranian people, but but it, it seems like. You know, I, I don't want to. We don't want to lose goodwill with the Iranian people. We want to keep maximum pressure on their country without making the people themselves the enemy, because they're not. They're they're our biggest allies in all of this, really. So, um, how that's, do we? What what, right. what can we do better to message to the Iranian people? We have to, in my view, un, unroll formally or display formally a policy uh, that I'd like to call maximum care. And it's a real follow-on to maximum pressure. They they actually complement each other because maximum pressure deals with the regime and maximum care would deal with the people. Now, the Trump administration has bent over backwards because there's been so many more protests inside Iran under its watch for them to signal that we stand with you. Um, but things like providing communications technology support so that the next time there's another internet blackout in Iran for six days, and then, uh, you know, two, three weeks later, Reuters comes out and, re and reports that almost 1,500 or more than 1,500 were killed, uh, we can understand that uh, it's not just per the Washington Post democracy that dies in the darkness. It's the Iranian people that have been dying in the darkness. Mm -hmm. So to permit them to communicate to send their messages abroad about like the help they need, the suffering they're going through, uh, uh, or to be able to communicate internally well with each other, to, to be able to amass together, protest, coordinate logistics, all of that kind of stuff, whether it's through satellites or any other kind of technology, our best and brightest minds, public and private partnerships, government and tech sector, uh, should be coming up with ways to help the Iranian people, to enable the streets to push back on the state. Yeah. And, and, and that should be a leading tool in our maximum care policy. Yeah, I fully, another one, go ahead. Yeah, another one should be, uh, you know, we came up with this term in December, uh, once uh, the, the, that November, December protest had kind of died down, um, or, or had, um, I didn't want to use the word died down because again, 1,500 dead is tragic, but the regime did use brute, force weapons of war against their own people um, is to come up with a protest policy playbook so that the next time there are protests uh, we are not caught flat-footed you know the media continuously calls these protests economic protests uh social protests oh these are just about gas prices these are just about chicken egg prices these are just about tomato prices this is just about a vote these are not just about those issues those are the triggers to get people onto the street but once people are on the street, they are critiquing Khamenei, they are critiquing Iran's foreign and security policy, they are doing a wholesale critique of the regime in Iran. And we got to be better about recognizing that. Yeah, We can't uh, just say this is about chicken eggs or this is about a liter of petrol. Yes, that's what sparks these protests, but that's not what sustains these protests. Uh, that's an excellent point. I, I hear that all the time. Uh, more than anything, the Iranian people need communication. Uh, with each other and and with the outside world, and to the extent that we can figure out how to do that, we we should be trying. Uh, last question I got for you: If there's um, are there any? I just want to get your top misconceptions, um, fallacies that you hear about Iran and the entire situation that you want to debunk. What are they? Uh, one thing is, well, there's several. Uh, one thing is that sanctions don't work. Uh, when, when, you, when you look at the Islamic Republic in its history, or that pressure doesn't work, um, there's only been a couple of things that have gotten, a couple of times when the regime has done a 180. And it's really when they've been confronted with pressure. Um, we've only had about a year or so of these sanctions on Iran because the oil sanctions uh, kicked in, uh, the, the full sanctions kicked in November 2018. We left the deal May 8, 2018, and all the oil waivers were removed in May of 2019. So really, it, it's just been about a, a full year of the Trump administration sanctions. And in one year's time, when you look at the macro economy of Iran, the U.S. has unilaterally been able to do more damage than about a decade of multilateral sanctions. It's an amazingly impressive accomplishment without having to fire a single shot. 
this is an amazing tool of, of coercion and punishment and deterrence uh, that does not involve the loss of life. Um, so we, we have to think about how to use our economic forces, our economic tools better as national security tools. And I think the Iran example is going to be a very instructive example for other adversaries moving ahead, how best to use the marketplace instead of politics uh, as a national security tool. There you go. Um, that's one. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but how long do you want to go? Give me one more. Uh, okay, just one more. Let's see another misconception here. We we already debunked that that it's the uh, the government of Iran rather than the sanctions that are co- that are perpetuating the crisis. We've already debunked that the government of Iran does not represent Iran or its long and proud history. We've already debunked that uh, max pressure doesn't work or isn't working. I don't know. We we could probably leave it there. Um, there there is there is a, a lot more fiction, unfortunately, in in some of the Iran analysis than fact. Um, it was a pleasure to be able to inject some of the fact into the conversation. I look forward to speaking with you hopefully again soon. But um, I think all eyes should be on May 8th. Uh, the Iranians, again, are probably poised to escalate once the coronavirus crisis issue goes away. Um, they, they will again look to turn the pressure on the administration and to have, uh, have America fight with one arm tied behind its back. So it's, it's going to be a, a very tough few months ahead in my view. Well, um Oh, it, it it will be, and um, no, we appreciate you coming on and, and helping us helping guide us through that. Um, there's going to be important decisions to make and important debates to be had. Um, were you, were you born in Iran? No, I'm born and raised here. I grew up in New York City, uh, gotcha. and then I've been in DC now about 12 years. Gotcha, gotcha. Well, we really appreciate you coming on and, and bringing your expertise to the forefront. Um, it's a it's an Thank important you. it's such an important topic, and. Uh,